Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Urology Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, we're going to be having Dr. Benjamin Press, who's going to be talking about genomic biomarkers for clinically localized prostate cancer. And then we'll have Dr. Amir Khan discuss. So we're going to have Benjamin Press uh, give his presentation first. Good morning, everyone. Um, this morning, I'll be um, presenting uh, genomic biomarkers uh, and their use for in the in clinically localized prostate cancer. Um, I have no disclosures to report. Um, so why is this important? Um, decision making in men with clinically localized prostate cancer is particularly nuanced. Um, there are a myriad of alternative prostate cancer risk assessment tests um, that are available to appropriately risk stratify men. And with that said, there's been an increased implementation of uh, tissue-based biomarkers to assist in decision making, whether that's to determine whether to proceed with active surveillance versus definitive treatment, or whether or not to proceed with adjuvant or salvage therapy after um, prostatectomy. So there are five uh, commercially available tissue-based biomarkers that I'll be discussing. Um, Confirm MDX, Decipher, Oncotype DX, Prolaris, and Promark. So, so there are, you know, there are some guideline statements um, regarding genomic biomarkers from the NCCN. Um, they recommend considering the use of genomic biomarkers to provide prognostic information for men with low or favorable intermediate risk disease. Um, they specify that the decipher assay can be used for prognostication after prostatectomy. Similar guideline statements um, from, hold on, hold on one second. Um, I have similar guideline statements um, from ASCO, um, which recommend that biomarkers only be used in situations where their use um, would impact management. They should not be used uh, routinely. You know, there's three large statements here, but that's pretty much the long and short of it. Uh, this is a summary table um, that'll sort of that sort of uh, outlines what you know. So that the outline of my talk, um, I'll present each test their mechanism of action, their indication, um, what they're reporting, and well, also what's important is the cost of the test. So I'm not gonna go through this table now, I'll sort of go through this as um, we move forward. This is a, this is adapted, this is taken from the AUA update series. This is their sort of proposed algorithm for how to use these tests. So for negative biopsy, we're using Confirm MDX. We have Oncotype DX, Prolaris, Decipher, and Promark for positive biopsies and when deciding between surveillance and treatment. And then after radical prostatectomy, when deciding um, whether or not to proceed with adjuvant or salvage therapy, um, we can use Decipher. So to get started, um, we'll get started with Confirm MDX. This is an assay that's used on benign biopsy tissue only. It identifies methylation patterns within key tumor suppression genes. Um, hypermethylation is associated with a higher risk of nearby prostate cancer due to field effect. Um, it's indicated for men with a negative biopsy within the last 30 months, but they still have an you still have an ongoing suspicion of prostate cancer. It costs uh, a little under $2,500 for a panel of 12 cores, and it is covered by Medicare. So this is a schematic um, provided by uh, MDX Health, sort of outlining how this works. As you can see here, you have all of your biopsy cores are net, you know, don't are not have are negative. Um, the cancer is sort of inter um, spurs between the cores, and you would expect that the cores that are immediately adjacent to um, malignancy to have higher methylation scores um, as compared to the ones that are uh, cores that are not. So these were ver verified in two. Um, in two, two large studies, a Matlock in Europe and the document trial in the US, um, they, they reported a negative predictive value of 90% and 88% respectively for the detection of prostate cancer. Um, but what about actionable or clinically significant prostate cancer? So this was a large, uh, this was a retrospective uh, study combining both of these cohorts, so about 850 patients. Uh, the investigators, they developed an algorithm that weighed methylation intensities. They called it EpiScore. It was designed to stratify uh, high methylation or methylation positive patients for risk of harboring clinically significant prostate cancer. 
So low methylation levels in this combined cohort led to a negative predictive value of 96% for high-grade cancer, which they uh, defined as Gleason greater than seven. And among those men with met in methylation positive men, um, EPI score was significantly higher for those with high grade cancer compared to those with no or low grade cancer. So, um, you know, so low methylation scores, low likelihood of Gleason grade group two and higher. Um, and EPI score was able to, you know, restratify men with high methylation scores as to who was at higher risk for high risk disease. Uh, our next test we'll be discussing is the Decipher test. Um, it is a tissue-based platform, measures the RNA expression of 22 genes that regulate cell proliferation, differentiation, immune modulation, androgen receptor signaling. This can either be done on prostate biopsy or radical prostatectomy samples. It is independent of clinical and demographic data. It's based on RNA levels only. Um, higher levels are thought to be found in more aggressive cancers. Um, scoring is from zero to one. There are three distinct risk categories. There's low risk, which is less than 0.45, whose intermediate risk, which is 0.45 to 0.6, and high risk is point is greater than 0.6. So here, what we're reporting after prostate biopsy, they're going to predict, you're reporting your risk of adverse pathology um, on prostatectomy, which is grade group three or higher, your five and 10 year metastatic risk, and your 15 year disease specific mortality. And after prostatectomy, they're, you're, they're reporting your five and 10 year metastatic risk and your 15 year disease specific mortality. It is covered by Medicare for men with NCC and very low, low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. Uh, it's designed to decide between surveillance and treatment after prostate biopsy and after prostatectomy, it's, help, it's, um, it's uses to, to help determine whether, you know, adjuvant or salvage radiation therapy is necessary. Um, it does cost about $5,100 though. So this is a, a sample, this is a report um, for after a prostate biopsy. As you see, we have um, clinical and pathology details, uh, the clinical stage, Gleason score, PSA. And here's what we're, and here's what really we're looking at here. They have your figure on the left with your high risk, intermediate risk, low risk, and then all your reporting. So your metastatic risk, your disease specific mortality risk, and your risk of adverse pathology at prostatectomy. So similarly, this is a sample report after prostatectomy. Again, up here we have our clinical information now including um, you know, op you know, operative metrics like positive margins, extra prostatic extension, seminal vesicle invasion, um, you know, plus Gleason score, PSA. Um, and once again, we have our figure on the left and our reported, reported statistics of five and 10 year metastatic risk and disease specific mortality risk. So Decipher is very well studied in the post-prostatectomy setting. That's what it was originally designed. That's what it was originally designed for. In a meta-analysis of five different studies, um, they identified 855 men with adverse pathology at time of prostatectomy. They found that Decipher was a statistically significant predictor of metastasis as the low, intermediate, and high-risk categories showed a 10-year uh, incidence of metastasis of 5.5, 15, and 26 uh, 0.7% respectively. So it's, uh, it's now, so also after prostate biopsy, um, this was a multi-institutional prostate biopsy data set. They had 647 patients with a uh, very low, low and favorable intermediate risk disease. This is retrospective. They all, they had biopsies that underwent decipher testing. All of these men um, had undergone radical prostatectomy. So they had 220 men with favorable intermediate risk disease, which they defined as um, Gleason grade group one or two, and then no more of the NCCN intermediate risk factors, which are PSA 10 to 20, um, clinical T2, B or C, or Gleason grade two. They found that high risk decipher scores in men predicted adverse pathology, which they defined as Gleason grade group three through five, greater than T P T3B disease or um, lymph node invasion. Um, there was no difference in the rates of adverse pathology between um, men with NCCN low and very low risk and those with favorable risk disease with low and intermediate um, decipher scores. So, you know, in the post-prostate biopsy setting, decipher was able to risk stratify men that rates of adverse pathology 
between different uh, NCCN risk groups. Um, the next, next tissue-based biomarker we'll be discussing is Oncotype DX. And it's another RNA expression assay um, of genes involved in androgen signaling, cellular organization, stromal response, and cellular pro proliferation. It's scored from zero to 100. Higher numbers indicate less favorable disease. It is covered by Medicare for patients with NCCN very low, low, and favorable intermediate risk disease. Um, it's designed to help inform decision making between active surveillance and treatment. It costs about $4,500. Uh, this is a report, uh, like a sample report. Um, they combine your clinical uh, information, your clinical data, and your Oncotype DX score um, to create to put you in a risk category. So in this person, this patient is very low risk. Their reported statistics for reporting ca prostate cancer death within 10 years, your metastasis within 10 years, and your risk of adverse pathology on prostatectomy, and the report more endpoints, which are the rate of high-grade disease and non-organ confined disease. So these are the things that the patients will be seeing and you and the patient will be seeing on their report. So this was a uh, study, this is a multi-institutional prospective study, uh, men with very low, low and favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. 114 of these men underwent, all, 114 patients that underwent prostatectomy. They found the Oncotype DX assay was a statistically significant predictor of adverse pathology, which they defined as Gleason score greater than four plus two and or PT3 disease. Interestingly enough, um, you know, albeit in a small, is a small sample, you know, it was reported as useful by 90% of patients and physicians. And they said it was, you know, reduced decision conflict. Um, so while it did predict that, you know, it also, you know, predicted adverse pathology and also seemed to ease, um, you know, ease the decision-making process in determining, in deter you know, in determining management for these patients. Um, I think this perhaps highlights, um, you know, one of the key pros of these uh, genomic biomarkers. Uh, our second, our second to last uh, biomarker that I'll be, I'll be going over is Prolaris. Um, this is an RNA expression assay of 31 cell cycle progression genes. Scores range from zero to 10. Higher scores signify more aggressive tumors. Um, this can be used either in the prostate biopsy or radical prostatectomy samples. Um, it is combined with clinical and pathologic variables to report. Um, we're reporting a 10-year risk of disease-specific mortality on surveillance, a 10-year risk of metastasis after definitive treatment, and you know, a number of different variables that are used, uh, you know, age, PSA, stage, the percent of positive cores, Gleason score, risk categories, and then for po uh, positive margins, uh, extracapsular extension, seminal vesicle invasion, positive nodes. So this is a, another, this is another report. Um, so they take your Polaris, or your, excuse me, your Polaris score, and they, they put you in what, you know, they are recommended groups. So this patient is recommended to be in active surveillance. You see on the right, their molecular score, this was 2.7. So the number this is at is zero to 10. And then here there was report your disease specific, your, your disease specific mortality, which again, they sort of characterize them in, um, they would put them in, they would recommend that they go in surveillance. And then they put their risk, their 10 year risk of metastasis for, you know, during active treatment. And if they were to pursue treatment, they would recommend a single modal treatment. Um, the last test um, that I'll be presenting is Promark. It, this is different than the other tests. It's a proteomic test, so it measures eight protein biomarkers that are that correlate with tumor aggressiveness. They are obtained from biopsy tissue. They're scored from zero to 100. This is for men with at least three plus three and three plus four disease. Um, higher scores predict a higher likelihood of Gleason grade group three and or greater than T3A disease. It is covered by Medicare. It does cost uh, $3,900. Um, unfortunately, it's not as well studied as um, genomic tests. Wait, am I missing it? Oh. oh, sorry. I think I skipped one of these slides. One of these slides got skipped. Uh, 
just to go back to Polaris, sorry. Um, one of the unique things about uh, the Polaris is a that it was actually validated for post-radiation therapy, um, which is unique to the other biomarkers. Um, it, was val it was validated as an independent predictor of biochemical recurrence. Um, right. So in conclusion, I think that there is um, an emerging role for the use of genomic biomarkers to assist with risk stratification for men with low and intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer. I think like all um, biomarkers, I don't think necessarily that they should be the kind of be all end all, but they should be um, sort of another uh, piece of the puzzle um, that should be used when counseling patients and guiding decision making. Um, it's important to note that there is no level one evidence uh, to support the use of genomic biomarkers. Um, there are no randomized control trials or observational data, you know, demonstrating that the use of these tests improves quality of life or, uh, you know, prostate cancer specific outcomes. Um, there is also no gold standard. Um, head to head comparison of these genomic biomarkers is very limited. Um, however, coming down you know, with that said, you know, down the, you know, coming, I guess, down the pipeline, there is a large um, study currently recruiting out of the University of Michigan, um, the G major trial. They will be comparing Oncotype DX, Decipher, and Prolaris in men with newly diagnosed low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. They're primarily looking at how many men remain on surveillance without treatment, um, because it really is unclear, you know, how often these tests actually change um, management. And finally, there is a lack of data to suggest that biomarkers are cost effective or really necessary for all patients. I think, you know, going back to our guideline statements, you know, they recommend the use where it's going to change management. They do not recommend, um, you know, that we just get these tests for, that we get these tests for everyone. But with that said, um, I think that the, the early, you know, the data is, I think, compelling that they work in, um, you know, in, in helping to risk stratify men. Um, with favorable for low and intermediate risk prostate cancer. So there is definitely, there is a use, but we just have to be selective in when we use them. So going back to my summary table, um, just take a look. So just, I hope this is, uh, you know, this is a little more, this is one thing kind of want to take everyone to take away. Um, just to test their mechanism, indication, what we're looking at and also how much it costs. I'm returning back to this figure, um, and hopefully, not, if it didn't make, if it wasn't kind of clear already, hopefully, it's a little more clear after this uh, after this talk. And these are my references. And thanks for uh, having me present. And I'll open up to any questions. Ben, this is Stan Honig. Uh, um, was a nice presentation. Is there any data on like additive value of <clears throat> different tests? So like one versus two versus three tests have a value that's better over one or is there any data on that? I don't know if Mike can help out or. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't find any in my, uh, in my search. I mean, great, but great talk, Ben. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is some data when Decipher published its initial validation studies, um, you know, the way they, the way their assay works, you know, they do full transcriptome analysis. So they basically have the expression levels of all the other genes and they've compared, at least in their data, have compared their profile to the other commercially available ones because you, you sort of have that information, you know, but I don't think it's been independently validated one to be better or, or multiple to, you know, two to be better than one or, or anything like that. Um, so that, that was a nice talk, Ben. I have a question, maybe Mike uh, could answer it if you don't know the answer, Ben, but uh, what makes me most uncomfortable is when we have Gleason 3 plus 4 is 7 um, in our specimen. And so we're using these genetic tests to make us feel better about trying to do active surveillance. But what a, where does volume of prostate cancer fit in now? Because, I mean, we used to use number of cores and uh, percent positivity of cores to make decisions. Uh, does, does the genetic test trump uh, volume of cancer? 
Um, yeah, Ben, I don't know if you're going to weigh in. I mean, I would say, yeah, it's tough. I mean, the, I think, I mean, I'm a, I'm a bit skeptical of all of these tests. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the way that they are, their, their method is, yeah, I mean, they're, they're agnostic that, to that information. They don't really know. Um, and the predictions don't take into account tumor volume or, or things like that. I mean, I think it's one parameter. So, I mean, yes, if the patient has other adverse features, I think that has to be re respected. I don't, I don't think there's just enough information to know if you can, uh, if a, a favorable decipher score, you know, uh, you know, trumps a, you know, a high volume gleason three, four tumor, but, but uh, it's just one extra data point is the way I would look at it. I mean, if, so, if someone has a high volume, you know, um, three plus four or seven prostate cancer, maybe that'd be a situation to not do a biomarker at all. I'm just, you know, I'm just, wondering, you know, where, where do the biomarkers fit in in that situation? I agree. I mean, I, I personally don't do, in a situation with a high volume gleason 3, 4, unless the patient is really wants that information, I don't generally recommend it because, um, you know, in a lot of these decision analyses, like a lot of this data gets looked in through like a decision lens and say, okay, well, if the patient is like 55 years old, has a high volume gleason 3, 4 tumor, um, you know, how much is it going to move the needle? So I think that we still need to use clinical judgment. And I mean, there's a lot of influence from industry who want us to use these tests and tell us that they are going to answer all of our questions. Um, you know, does a year of active surveillance matter? Maybe not, but, uh, but I think we need to exercise good judgment before we order. And maybe something we should think about as a department is saying what the criteria are, um, just so we make it easier, because often it's very difficult because, or if you get a, someone who has a favorable risk, has a Gleason 3-3 tumor and they have a bad decipher score, then you're, you're kind of stuck the other way because you have an adverse data point. I just heard about a case, I just you know, was asked to review a case of someone who had 5%, half of a millimeter of Gleason 3-3, but had an unfa a highly unfavorable decipher score. And you know, should he get a prostatectomy, should he not? I mean, so I think it, it's not, I don't think it's gonna answer all of the questions, but it's, it's a helpful data point. I mean, I had experience where I, I um, ran a decipher test and it was a, you know, a low risk test. And then on a subsequent biopsy, we ran it again and it was a high risk um, decipher score and it, it completely changed. And it just made me wonder if, if just the tumors are heterogeneous and just a matter of where you're sampling. So I, it's almost like you can make a story however, however you want it to go. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, yeah, there is, there is data, you know, not from the companies, you know, when the companies published on this, they, they, they explicitly went at that question and they said that, you know, Oncotype and Decipher account for heterogeneity, but independent studies have looked at these and uh, have found that there is heterogeneity. So, uh, Dan, I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's, I don't think it's fully fleshed out, um, but, you know, I, I can't tell you the last time I've made a decision independently based on a, a genomic test where that is the only thing that moved me. When, I don't know if there are others on the call who have thoughts about that. I don't know, Dan, have you treated someone just because they have a favorable or unfavorable profile? I mean, I think if I'm leaning towards active surveillance and they have low risk, it just makes me feel better about my decision. Um, I think the thing that's just, again, makes me uncomfortable is, is the great group two prostate cancers. I, you know, it's, you know, I, I feel like it's just a, a matter of time before they get treated. You know, I, I don't know if I have anyone who's on long-term active surveillance with that unless they're you know, older. So this is uh, Dinesh chiming in. The, uh, right now, these are uh, uh, sort of like fancy new technology of Catan tables, right? They they take known variables to try and predict an outcome, which is a population based uh, outcome that may or may not apply to the single individual patient in front of you, but it's a probability statistic. Now, having said that, it is almost assuredly going to be the case that uh, this is just the very tip of the iceberg of our technology in doing this, because we know that DNA uh, and expression of the uh, DNA determines hair color and eye color and all of those things, and it determines even more subtle things like one's uh, tendency to become alcoholic or schizophrenia. And it almost assuredly determines tumors of behavior, uh, uh, the, the, the behavior of tumors. We just have to delineate exactly what those genes are 
uh, and, and bitter, bigger subsets of uh, patients. And I think that day is coming. And the high throughput stuff is so rapidly evolving. These costs are going down markedly. I mean, when I was doing micro array stuff for one patient, it would be like $10,000. And now it's, uh, you know, you do a, a, a ton of them much, much, much cheaper than that. And it costs a lot to do it. It costs a lot less than those costs that uh, you put up, Ben, because it's a pretty high profit margin uh, study. Um, yeah, I, 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 Dinesh, I, I agree. And I think it's, you know, but what's interesting is that these are, these are not uh, germline tests. You know, these are somatic, uh, somatic expression tests. So they're looking at, you know, relative expression levels within the tumor. So theoretically, they can change and, um, you know, that's going to, that's going to be an interesting question. Um, I know we have to move on to the next talk, but I just had a quick plug. We are doing a study that is actually specifically looking at interviewing patients and doctors who order these tests to try to understand what their experiences are, because, you know, we've, we've done a lot of these interviews already. And what we, what we have found already is that patients are really ambivalent about it. They don't really understand, frankly, when you talk to them, which we've had the opportunity to do when you talk to them and ask them. Did you have genetic testing, genomic testing? They usually, sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. What the results showed and what it means for them is very unclear. And it's really fascinating and it hasn't been done before. So we're looking to interview more patients and um, more providers. So if you have anybody who you think might be a good interviewer or interviewee, please let me know. Um, we're doing them over Zoom and it's, uh, it's been very interesting. Okay, so we're going to move on to our next talk. Uh, we have Dr. Amir Khan, who's going to be discussing prostate. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amir, for those of you that don't know me. Um, today, I'll be talking about prostate abscess. Um, the reason I picked this topic is, uh, you know, it, it's a rare entity, but uh, I found there's not a lot of guidelines or information on this topic. So I was very curious um, as to what, what information is out there on how to treat uh, prostate abscess. All right, so I have no uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. So just for some historical background. So knowledge of the prostate dates back to Herophilus, the ancient Greeks in uh, 350 BC. Um, Niccolo Massa, who's an Italian anatomist, was, uh, is accredited with discovering and describing the prostate gland in the 16th century. Um, the word prostate, interestingly, um, originated it's questionably whether it was uh, French anatomist uh, André de Lorenz or Ambroise Paré who first came up with the term prostate. So since Ben and I were having a prostate day, I, I like to delve into the history. Um, there's a picture of Nicolas Massa up there. Prostatitis uh, was actually um, mentioned in the 1800s. It was treated with prostate massage. And in our contemporary times, uh, there was a letter to editor in Journal of Urology in 1978 that came up with this uh, classification of prostatitis, uh, which included acute bacterial prostatitis, which is very relevant to prostate abscess. And over here, you'll see prostate anatomy. And when we're talking about prostate abscess, particularly the central zone and the peripheral zone are very relevant because that's oftentimes where we'll see prostate abscesses. So acute bacterial prostatitis, um, second here. it uh, usually occurs in men aged 20 to 40. There's a second peak for men over the age of 60. It's multifactorial etiology. Um, you know, likely it's an ascending urethral infection. You have this intraprostatic reflux of infected urine enters the ejaculatory duct and into the prostate. But now there's increasing other etiologies, um, such as direct seeding from prostate biopsy, lower GU tract manipulation, or even hematogenous dissemination, which you can see a lot of times with uh, staph aureus um, associated prostate abscesses or prostatitis um, in the setting of osteomyelitis, patients who have osteomyelitis or abscesses who are often immunocompromised, which I'll get into. But for acute bacterial prostatitis, sort of the basic uh, prostatitis that can precede prostate abscess, uh, oftentimes, you see patients come in with acute symptoms of UTI, most commonly frequency, dysuria, urgency. They may possibly have systemic symptoms, um, such as fever, malaise, myalgias, 
um, lower abdominal perineal pain, suprapubic pain, possible urinary retention due to swelling and spasm. Um, up to one third of patients with, who have prostatic abscess can actually have urinary retention. Um, and it can progress to sepsis. Um, patients who have acute bacterial pro uh, prostatitis after um, a prostate biopsy or GU manipulation, they tend to be older as opposed to the spontaneous um, acute bacterial prostatitis patients. They have greater likelihood of sepsis, um, they often tend to be sicker. So you should consider acute bacterial prostatitis in any man with febrile UTI. Um, to delve into the microbiology, uh, it's most commonly E. coli, but there's other um, common gram-negative organisms that can contribute to it. Pseudomonas, Proteus, Klebsiella, Serratia, Enterococcus um, as well for uh, positive. And then historically, Neisseria gonorrhea was associated with it very commonly, but now with antibiotic therapy, that's, that's become a lot more rare. Um, you could see mycobacterium tuberculosis with prostatitis, especially immunodeficiency. And when patients are immunodeficient, uh, you see a much wider array of infecting organisms, uh, like I mentioned, Staph aureus and MRSA especially. So it's very important in any patient where you're suspecting acute bacterial prostatitis to assess the presence of diabetes, HIV, um, comorbidities, and any immunocompromising conditions. So when you're evaluating the patient, uh, you want to look at the cause. Uh, you know, is this spontaneous or is this after, you know, like we mentioned, GU tract manipulation, prostate biopsy, or any hematogenous spread, um, which in one-fourth of patients who have prostate abscess, um, not, not prostate, but prostate abscess, they can acquire it hematogenously. And like I mentioned, note the comorbidities. Particularly important are immunocompromised. Um, diabetes is the most important. I would say if you take home anything uh, from this talk is that uh, diabetic patients are very commonly associated with prostatic abscess. HIV and AIDS, cirrhosis, CKD, whether they're on dialysis, chemotherapy, if they have rheumatologic conditions, again, very important. Important to know if they've been on antibiotics. Is this, um, you know, is this persisting despite antibiotics? Was this not adequately treated with antibiotics? Because that's going to raise your threshold for uh, abscess. And also important to know what's their symptom onset. Um, and, you know, kind of get to getting the chrono chronology of um, when their symptoms started, how long their duration's been, when they got the antibiotics, et cetera. Important to also assess retention in PBRs, uh, as many as a third of patients with prostate abscess. Uh, can mean urinary retention. And then to do a gentle DRE, um, you know, tender prostate can be seen in 60 to 90% of cases, um, honestly, most cases of um, acute bacterial prostatitis. Um, but then what I'll, I'll talk about the classic body fluctuance that's associated with abscess is a little more variable. Uh, although it's been pathognomonic, it's, it's a little more variable in uh, its association with prostate abscess. You want to also get CBC, creatinine, UA, midstream urine culture, which actually, you know, half of patients can be positive, but it's not necessarily indicative, especially in patients where you're thinking of an abscess. That urine culture may not reflect the true organism, which I'll, which I'll get into, uh, as well as blood cultures, um, especially in patients that you uh, suspect they're very sick or they're having systemic symptoms. Now, the question of imaging, it's not routinely indicated in acute bacterial prostatitis. So that's sort of the big question that you, you deal with is, is when should you get imaging? And, and it's typically when you're suspicious of a prostate, prostatic abscess. And it's difficult to discern between the two, you know, and so that's why it's important to know, you know, when you're gonna be more suspicious of a prostate abscess and how you're gonna uh, deal with that. So for acute bacterial prostatitis, antibiotics are the mainstay of therapy. Um, the EAU actually recommends, um, you know, it's a complicated UTI to, to start off with um, parenteral antibiotics, uh, whether broad spectrum penicillin, second or third generation cephalosporins could be combined with immunoglycosides based on history, prior culture, susceptibilities. And you can switch to oral therapy in 24 to 48 hours if symptoms are improving. Um, a lot of times, though, you know, if patients are very stable, you can give Bactrim. Uh, fluoroquinolones have good prostatic penetration, but obviously there's concerns for um, side effects and resistance, um, but those are another option. And then recommend a repeat urine culture at seven days after therapy. Um, and, you know, if it's still positive, you can, quick, you can initiate an alternate therapy. Um, and then for specifically for transrectal prostate biopsy, um, you know, AUA white papers mentioned that, you know, you want to do aggressive resuscitation, 
broad spectrum antibiotic coverage of uh, carbapenem zamicacin or second or third generation cephalosporin. For acute bacterial prostatitis, the traditional recommendation is four weeks of antibiotics. Uh, there is data that two weeks of fluoroquinolone for uh, acute bacterial prostatitis has similar bacterial cure rate, 89% versus 70, uh, 97%. Um, so there is a question of whether you can do two weeks, but traditionally it's been four weeks. Um, NSAIDs and Flomax can also be given if you're uh, for pain and if there's concern for lower urinary tract symptoms. You know, when you're thinking of prostatitis or abscess, um, you you know, if you're concerned for retention, you, you want to do an SP tube if, if you're concerned for a prolonged uh, course. If there's if you're really just looking for short-term drainage, CIC or brief urethral catheterization is okay, but ultimately SP tube is the most protective form of drainage um, when you're dealing with an infection or abscess in the prostate. So to now talk about prostate abscess, uh, it's a localized collection of purulent fluid within the prostate, often as a complication of acute bacterial prostatitis. It's now rare with the advent of antibiotics, uh, used to have a mortality up to 30%. Um, recently, you know, in contemporary times, it's about one to 16% is estimates um, and you know, carries a risk of sepsis. And so when do you suspect that? It's important to know when to suspect it when you're dealing with a patient that you suspect has prostatitis. Um, you would suspect it in a patient who has a very high fever. Um, if they have a history of immunosuppression, over 50% of patients with prostate abscess have diabetes. Uh, it's been estimated in the literature. Whether the patient's debilitated, um, you know, elderly, debilita debilitated, poor performance status, that can also um, raise your index of suspicion. If they have a poor response to antibiotics within 24 to 48 hours, um, you would wanna be more suspicious for prostate, uh, prostate abscess. They have a history of primary voiding dysfunction, neurogenic bladder, indwelling catheter. You'd also want to be suspicious. And then recent prostate biopsy, uh, it's estimated that 8 to 11% of prostate abscess patients have had a recent prostate biopsy, as well as any recent instrumentation. Those are all patients where you'd want to think about prostate abscess. And so again, like I mentioned, it's important to contextualize the history, your DRE clinical exam, labs, and hemodynamics of the patient, and uh, allow that to inform your decision to obtain imaging. And so when you do, a, when you see fluctuance on DRE, which is pathognomonic classic body fluctu fluctuance, you can suspect a prostate abscess, but it's, it's quite variable in the literature. It's actually ranged from 16 to 88% in the papers I looked at um, of finding a, a body fluctuant prostate on a DRE. For imaging, um, so imaging can be confirmatory. Transrectal ultrasound uh, trust is actually uh, sort of the standard. Uh, it's cheap, minimally invasive. Uh, you can show hypoechoic or anechoic areas with potential loculations. And additionally, you can treat it with aspiration with the truss. The only concerns is, you know, again, it's, it's, it's provider comfort, how comfortable they are with using the truss to um, detect abscess. There is some subjectivity and there's also concerns for tolerance patient has hemorrhoids, fistula, or having severe pain, then you clearly can't, um, wouldn't use a truss. And a lot of times, more often in, in my experience here, especially at Yale, we find these on CT or, or MRI. Um, you know, there is a radiation and cost concern with those modalities, um, but they can show uh, spread beyond the prostate and they may be better tolerated in these patients who have uh, pain. But I do think truss does have a role in the initial uh, diagnosis of prostate abscess. So the important factors to consider when you're in, in prostate abscess, when you're evaluating patient and you're thinking about what modalities uh, you're gonna use to treat this abscess, is again, the patient age and comorbidities. Uh, we talked about the comorbidities, but in particularly age, whether they're a young patient um, or an elderly patient can uh, inform the goals of care. Um, you know, if the patient has concerns about fertility or retrograde ejaculation or continence, um, versus if they're a patient with long-standing bladder outlet obstruction, that can inform your decision about what treatment path you'll take. The severity of the infection, um, you know, whether, whether human amphibian is stable, how sick they are. The abscess size is very important, um, which we'll talk about. And the number of abscesses that there are, whether there's a single abscess or multiple abscesses. The complexity of the abscesses, uh, whether there's multi multiple loculations, uh, like I mentioned, whether there's a presence of bladder outlet obstruction, their ability to tolerate transrectal ultrasound is obviously going to uh, limit your treatment choices. 
And then also whether this is a recurrence, um, whether they've been treated recently and this is a recurrence that's happening again, can also inform your decision. So one thing is interesting, if you see prostate abscess in a young, healthy patient, it can often reflect a chronic comorbidity such as diabetes. Um, it's estimated 17 to 25% of patients with, uh, newly uh, with prostate abscess are newly diagnosed with diabetes. So really important to keep diabetes in mind. The, treat the three treatment modalities are uh, conservative antibiotic therapy. So you know, there's emergence of atypical drug-resistant organisms associated with prostate abscess, ESBL, MRSA, like we mentioned. So it's important to start with broad spectrum parenteral antibiotics. And there's a very low threshold to change antibiotics if the patient's not improving, regardless of your culture data. If they're not improving, you really want to change the antibiotic. And I would say 24 to 48 hours is really how far you, you take it. Uh, and then there's percutaneous drainage, which you can do th with the transrectal ultrasound or transperineal drainage. And there's transurethral treatment. We could do deroofing, TERP, or even holmium laser enucleation. Um, and then open surgical drainage is rare, oftentimes for extra prostatic extension of the abscess. Um, but, you know, with poor healing and often these immunocompromised patients, it's, it's not commonly done. Very important to get procedural culture because the urine culture, uh, like I'll talk about um, later, is not often associated with the, the infecting organ, the, the etiology of the organism that's causing this abscess. So you want to get it right from the source, um, and it's very important to, to obtain that. Overall, there's not any consensus or guidelines to inform therapy with prostate abscess. Reason is, is mostly case reports, expert opinions, case series, retrospective reviews, not a lot of perspective um, studies on prostate abscess. So there's a paper I looked at with, uh, for, by Dr. Lenore Ackerman, who was, you know, came visited us. It was a very great paper on prostate abscess. And, um, and she looked at a review of diagnosis and treatment of patients with prostate abscess. She saw 77% of patients ultimately underwent intervention. Um, she recommended conservative management for patients, stable patients with one abscess under a centimeter. That's kind of an important point. If it's a single abscess under a centimeter, conservative management has been, is, is an okay choice. Um, and you can do serial imaging to ensure resolution. In terms of aspiration, she recommended the truss aspiration as first line. Um, there's no superiority for transperineal, um, and it's not as commonly done by urologists. And, um, you know, there's also been reports of development of periurethral or perineal abscesses. So we just need more information on transperineal, but truss aspiration, given that you're, you're especially diagnosing through that method, uh, can be a first line treatment, but it, it again, depends on the, the details of the abscess. Um, it can be done at the bedside with local anesthesia. It's minimally invasive, low cost, not affecting as much the fertility um, or, uh, you know, continence. And, uh, you know, you don't have the risk of general anesthesia. But the con is, it is associated with quite a high risk of recurrence in incomplete treatment. And reported recurrence ranges from 15 to 33%, even up to 50% in some of the papers I'll go over. Transurethral, she showed that about a third of patients are going to eventually require transurethral drainage. It's recommended for large multiloculated infections. Uh, so they have large abscess over a centimeter or over two centimeters, which I'll talk about. Or if this is a recurrent or if they have multiple abscesses or multiloculated, if there's associated BPH or LUTs, if there's medial lobe involvement, you may want to consider transurethral. Um, it has a lower rate of recurrence, reported 0 to 7% in the literature, um, short, associated with shorter hospitalization lengths. But the cons are that there's a risk of uh, retrograde ejaculation, stricture, incontinence. Um, it involves anesthesia. Um, and then, again, another option is homium laser enucleation, which there was a retrospective study on eight patients in South Korea that showed um, that they had 100% success with uh, homium laser enucleation um, for treatment of... Uh, prostate abscess. There's another um, paper um, out of Saudi Arabia by uh, group Al-Ladari uh, that looked at the three treatment modalities. Again, a retrospective study, 23 patients. They had a CT diagnosis from 2013 to 2018. 39% had conservative management, 35% transurethral, 26% with tr uh, truss aspiration. And they had 50% recurrence in the truss aspiration group, and it was associated with longer length of stay. It wasn't significant in this study, but it was significant in other studies. It's 11.2 days. Uh, the mean was 8.4 days. 
So they again recommended the similar um, recommendations, conservative management with antibiotics for sub-centimeter single prostate abscess, and then deroofing for large multi-loculated or multiple abscesses. And this was an interesting algorithm they came up with. Um, so you, know, you diagnose prostate abscess, you can first go to truss um, per their algorithm. And if it's under se uh, centimeter, like we said, you do conservative measures with antibiotics and then you reassess, they're either cured or they didn't respond. And if they didn't respond, then you go, they, go, they say go to ultrasound drainage. Um, and if that didn't improve, then you do the CT scan. And then if you initially just have an over a centimeter abscess, they recommend ultrasound drainage plus antibiotics. And then again, if that didn't improve, you do the CT scan and that'll tell you um, some more information for transurethral drainage. Um, so that's an interesting algorithm they have, although I, I, I would say that over a centimeter, you can consider uh, transurethral drainage as well, um, depending on, again, how sick the patient is and some of that information that I mentioned um, in, the, in the history. So another pa uh, paper in the Korean Journal of Urology that uh, compared these treatment methods uh, by Jang et al. So this is, again, a retrospective study, 2000 to 2010, 52 patients. Average abscess size was 3.8 centimeters. And 42% of patients had diabetes. So again, another important point that, uh, to, to look at diabetes. Conservative treatment was in uh, 11 out of 52, a little under 20, uh, about 20%. Uh, Transurethral deroofing was in a little under 50% of the patients and truss was in about 40 something percent of the patients. Um, hospitalization was uh, on average 17.5 days. But there was, a, there was a significant variance. So conservative patient uh, management patients, 19 days in the hospital. Transurethral was 10.2 days and trust was 23.2 days. So again, a significantly longer hospital stay. Uh, they had 22.2% recurrence. So again, those are the things that concern you about trust aspiration when you're considering it. So their recommendations, again, monofocal abscess under a centimeter, use antibiotics. But if it's multifocal, greater than a centimeter, if there's septic shock, if this is a recurrent abscess, uh, there's poor response to antibiotics after 48 hours, they said to just do transurethral uh, drainage in those situations. There's another paper, um, this was out of India by Perkate et al, published in the Arab Journal of Urology. It was a 10 year experience from their hospital. Retrospective study, 2007 to 2016, 44 patients. They, shot, they saw, um, so 68%, they, they compared aspiration versus transurethral. With the first aspiration, they had 68% success, um, treat, uh, just initial treatment of the abscess. 89% um, of their patients who got the, um, had success on subsequent aspirations and mean amount, they required two aspirations, one to three. So again, that recurrence that we've been talking about, whereas transurethral had 96% success just on initial treatment. And there was a shorter length of stay, it was significant, 6.1 versus 12.5 days with transurethral surgery. Another paper, this was a prospective randomized trial um, out of Egypt, uh, urology and owls in 2018 by Selim et al. And um, it was 2009 to 2015, they had 32 patients. They looked at trust on day five um, to assess the abscess. And uh, again, DRU is fluctuating only 41% of patients. Um, and the prostate abscess was peripheral in 53%, central in 47%. So talking about those regions that we mentioned. They saw recurrence, so 31% recurrence with uh, transrectal ultrasound aspiration, whereas 6% with transurethral. And again, so that's consistent with the papers we've been seeing. Hospital stay, 12.9 days in trust. One of their patients got a urethral rectal fistula as a complication. And then 7.25 days with transurethral. And the complications, one had septic shock, three had epididymal architis, two had stricture. So a little bit morbidity with the procedure, but decreased recurrence, decreased hospital stay. And interestingly, like that point that I was mentioning earlier, their urine culture showed 44% E. coli, staph aureus in 15.6%, but no organisms in 41%. But then the procedural culture showed this wide array, the E. coli in 37.5%, staph aureus in 25%, pseudomotus in 19%, Klebsiella in 13%, no organisms still in 7%. So again, very important to get procedural cultures to inform your antibiotic decision. Another paper from um, Turkish Journal of Urology, this was a systematic review. I, I, I like they had an algorithm, they had a different algorithm that we can look at in this paper. So what they said was, um, you know, if you expect to suspect uh, prostate abscess, you know, you do clinical assessment or they fail to respond, like we said, in 24 to 48 hours. 
you get blood cultures, midstream urine, uh, you start antibiotics. First, you look at whether the truss is feasible. If it's not, you do CT MRI. If it is, you can do the truss. It has the benefit of you know, being minimally invasive, low cost, easy to do at the bedside. And they actually used a, a abscess threshold of two centimeters. So if, if the abscess was under two centimeters, they said, go ahead and do conservative management with antibiotics. Um, if it was over two centimeters, the patient's not stable and they can go to the OR, do transurethral. If they're stable or they can't go to the OR, you can do aspiration. Um, and then if they fail to respond to the aspiration or to the ana aspiration antibiotics, then you do transurethral. And then if it's a septated, like we talked, septated, multiloculated, multiple abscesses, um, then for age under 50, like we talked about for those um, concerns for retrograde ejaculation or, or uh, continence, et cetera, you, know, you can discuss that with the patient. You can do aspiration. But age over 50, they say, do transurethral um, deroofing or TERP. And so this is just to show that algorithm before um, sort of the differences, they had one centimeter. So some, some differences in these two algorithms, but it gives you kind of a general gestalt to, to move forward and assess these. So the conclusions that I'm leaving you with are, you know, prostatic abscess is a rare but serious complication of acute bacterial prostatitis. Um, you should suspect it in the context of immunosuppression, especially diabetes. Poor response to antibiotics within 24 to 40 hours if they're not improving or recent instrumentation um, the imaging modality really depends on your treatment decision, patient preferences, provider preferences, clinical context, and especially the tolerance, whether they can tolerate a transrectal ultrasound. And um, the treatment, you know, you're, you're informed by history, clinical severity, abscess size and number, complexity, again, the presence of bladder outlet obstruction, the risks of the transurethral procedure, and the ability to tolerate trust, and whether this is recurrent or not. And I think you can solidly say that under a centimeter, you can do antibiotics. One to two centimeters is sort of the questionable part where whether you can do antibiotics versus aspiration versus transurethral, just jumping straight to transurethral in that one to two centimeter range. And again, that's where you, I think you should look at these other um, clinical factors. And then if they're over two centimeters, if they're more complex, if they're larger, you should do transurethral intervention. And again, very important in all of these to get, try to get um, culture data uh, from the uh, source. And you know, what this shows is that there's, it's, it's important for more prospective trials to develop guidelines on how to treat prostate abscess. You know, while it may be rare, it's quite serious. And I think we just need more information on um, these modalities and which one is, is uh, better. Those are my references and uh, open it up to questions. Thank you very much. So that was a nice talk, Amir. Um, I was just wondering if anyone uh, on the call could just comment on their own experience with um, doing a aspiration versus, um, you know, transurethral resection of an abscess. I mean, is, can anyone, you know, maybe more senior who uh, has seen more abscesses in the past comment on it? Uh, <clears throat> this is Stan's say, uh, you know, we don't see this very often, but I think a lot depends on the location of the abscess. If it's, if you look at it on transrectal or MR and it looks like it's close to the urethra, I think the TUR is going to be the more definitive therapy. By the same token, if it's posterior and it's easily accessible to a needle transrectally, I think that that's a reasonable approach as well. So I think you have to guide your treatment based on the location of the abscess more than anything else. What size needle do you use? I mean, I, I'd imagine like you know, the spinal needles we use to do uh, prostate blocks might be too small to really to aspirate any pus. I mean, are you using like a large like 18 gauge needle that you'd use for biopsying? I don't think you really need an 18 gauge. I think you start with a small needle and you kind of work your way up. A lot of times you can get that stuff out with like a 21 or something like that. So I don't think you have to start with a bigger needle, you know, an 18. I think you can start smaller and you just, you know, you follow it as you do it. So if you're doing it transrectally, you watch the abscess get smaller as you do it. So, you know, I think that you're guided by your response um, to the ultrasound guide, guided biopsy. 
you know, if we're doing it or, or uh, IR is doing it, if it's in the hospital. Yeah, one, one thing I was thinking about with this presentation, I think um, there was one comment about, about it, but uh, Amir really didn't talk about it, is, is a transperineal approach. Because I know that's the, um, the trend with prostate biopsies. And maybe that would make more sense to try to avoid a uh, urethrorectal fistula, you know, using a transrectal ultrasound and then, and then try to aspirate, you know, transperineally. But um, I'm not sure you know, how comfortable we would do that as urologists or if we need IR to help us with that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dr. Ackerman's paper was kind of, you know, she she talked about it very reluctantly that, you know, it's 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 she feels it was associated with um, these periurethral perineal abscesses and um, that there's just no need that since we're so comfortable with the transrectal approach um, and that it's not associated with a very significant risk of sepsis. Um, but yeah, it is interesting. I mean, especially with this transperineal biopsy. Uh, prostate biopsy approach, you know, whether I think should, we just need more information to compare them. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments for Amir? Okay, well, it's almost uh, 8.30, so We'll conclude uh, Urology Grand Rounds. Uh, thank you everyone, have a great weekend.